and she will be speaking on red geyser star formation operation and feedback in nearby galaxy so ladies and gentlemen the floor is yours please do i have to do one yeah okay okay can can people hear me oh everyone has to mute okay is it is it louder than normal i think it but probably yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay 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 <laughs> okay uh, and also i don't want to guard this um so hi everyone uh, so thank you so much uh, for inviting me especially to professor deependra nondi and uh, sorry for taking up so much of your time uh, using technical uh, uh, errors uh but i'll be talking about the work that i have done over the last 5 5 and a half years during my phd so it's broadly about how galaxies stop forming stars towards the end of their lifetime and what's the role of the central supermassive black hole in that and uh in that context i will talk about this relatively new but very exciting population of galaxies that we call red geysers and i'll tell you their story and i'll tell you how they kind of why they're interesting and how they fit in in this global picture of galaxy formation and star formation suppression okay so then we start uh, we of course have to start by showing you the picture of this our most powerful the biggest telescope uh, in space right now so i'm talking about the james webb space telescope and uh, jwst looks at the universe at infrared wavelengths and this is the first deep image that was taken by webb and it's already publicly released it's actually one of the deepest and the sharpest view of the infrared sky that we have right now so this was one of the first images that was taken by webb and it's already the deepest image that exists so you can imagine the capability of jwst and in this huh because there is a problem of the ratio the yeah so you can go up like farther back much farther than whatever anyone has seen in the infrared uh, wavelength uh so yeah and in this so this is a patch of the sky surrounding a massive galaxy cluster so the cluster is called max 0728 something and in this image i think the color contrast is not that great but like you can see there are hundreds of galaxies in this image of different shapes sizes morphology for example there are spiral galaxy like this one which looks kind of like this uh and there are also elliptical galaxies like that one which looks spheroidal in shape and there are also many other things in between so there are a massive diversity in the in the type of galaxies you see so if you want to study these galaxies so let us just take a closer look at some of the nearby galaxies that we have so this is a uh spiral galaxy which is much much close by this so this incredible picture was taken by the hubble space telescope which is sometimes called the predecessor of the james webb um although i don't agree to that and uh this in this picture you can see so many details right so you can see those uh this kind of swirling dust lanes along the spiral arms you can see this uh young this blobs this bright blobs here and there so these are actually clusters of young stars which are forming out of this gas and dust in the, and they are sprinkled all over the galaxy right so you can see that you can resolve them for nearby galaxies using hubble so this is a spiral galaxy so spiral galaxies in general they are very young and they are actively forming stars so that's why you actually see all those young star clusters because they have a lot of young stars they have young stellar population and these galaxies generally have a blue color and why is that again because they have young stars so those young massive ob stars they radiate in the blue wavelength more so that's why the galaxy in total have a more blue color on the why is it the spiral galaxies tend to be young I mean, oh that rather when the galaxies become old it just change shape yeah 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 so it's generally seen that the spirals are more young and they the galaxies they form in a kind of disky way and uh, when you have the reason you have this spiral structures is because all those dust kind of align along those those spiral bar uh, bar and spirals in in those kind of way so and then eventually uh, you know there you encounter mergers and you disrupt the the diskiness and you become more kind of spherical in shape 
and you become dispersion dominated. So there are lots of movement in the Z direction, so which you don't have when you have Young. Um, yeah, so uh, you know there is another kind of galaxies uh, speaking morphologically, so speaking about the shape. So these are elliptical galaxies, which look mostly spheroidal in shape. And these galaxies are mostly old and evolved systems. And they have very little star formation happening right now. So if you look at the stars of these galaxies, these are mostly old. So these are dominated by old stellar populations. So here you don't see those young star clusters that I was showing you in the spiral galaxies. And these galaxies have a red color. And that is again because they lack young stars. So that's why they lack the blue color. And hence they are kind of more reddish, uh, the galaxies. And these are also sometimes called red galaxies. So you can see that whenever I'm talking about galaxies, I'm talking about how much stars they're forming right now, right? So I'm talking about their star formation. And that's actually one of the basic characteristic feature of a galaxy. How much star it is, how much, how many, how many stars is forming right now? What's their star formation rate? And what depicts how much star formation will happen? That is determined by the amount of gas and dust which is present. So remember, in the spiral galaxies, you have those dust lanes, right? Those spiral dust structures. And you are seeing stars forming out of those dust. So when you have a lot of dust, you also have lots of cold gas. And those cold gas, when the gas is cold, they can't move around much, so they tend to kind of settle down and they can collapse under self gravity and they can eventually trigger fusion and things like that and they can form stars. So if you have a lot of gas, you will probably have a lot of stars. So there is this, there is this correlation here. And that's what happens in spiral galaxies. You see a lot of gas and dust there, so you form a lot of stars. In elliptical galaxies, however, I just told you that they don't have that much star formation, right? So I told you elliptical galaxies are mostly old. They don't form a lot of stars. So initially, people thought that maybe there are not gas, there are no gas there in elliptical galaxies, and that's why you don't form stars. So that was the initial thinking. But it turns out that's not the case. So the reason elliptical galaxies don't form stars is not having, the problem is not that they don't have gas. Actually, there have been quite a lot of gas that have been detected in uh, elliptical galaxies. And there have been work from the 90s, uh, 1904, uh, 1994, and even before, where people have detected cold gas in elliptical galaxies. Maybe not as much as spiral galaxies have, but still enough. And they could trigger some stop star formation. So those cold gas can trigger some star formation if they wanted. But however, yeah. So when I'm talking about cold gas, I'm generally talking about, you know, 10 Kelvin gas, like molecular gas. But you can also have slightly lower density, like cooler, like cool neutral gas or things like that. Uh, but in general, you have, so we have detected gas, like cold gas, cooler gas, in elliptical galaxies, but we still didn't see the star formation that we were looking for. So that is the problem. So if we go about and look for star formation in elliptical galaxies, you would not detect that much, but you detect the cold gas. So what is happening? So you have the fuel for forming stars, but somehow the star formation is not happening in those elliptical galaxies. So everyone understood the problem, right? So this is the basic premise of this, uh, of this study. Yeah, so yeah, so these are all so elliptical galaxies generally dominated by old stars. So they have their they are generally, you know, more older, so they are redder and they are less luminous. Yeah, their luminosity is lower. Uh yeah, like there is a basic difference between the yeah, between those two populations. But the question here is different. The question is that why how come you can't form new stars in the elliptical galaxies even though you have the cold gas, you have the fuel. So the cold gas is the fuel for forming stars. So you have the fuel, but somehow you can't start the car. So that's the problem here. No, no, no. So when you, when you detect cold gas, it's the same cold gas that you detect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's not the problem. Uh -huh. 
supernova Yeah, so there are supernova effects, right? So I'm going to talk about feedback, and supernova feedback is an important thing. But for elliptical galaxies, ellipticals are generally massive, so they have kind of seen the universe for a long time. So they have been around for a long time. So they are very massive. And if you just have a few supernovas here and there, that would not help to explain why uh, you have so much gas, but you don't have stars, but you don't have new stars, right? So that's what I'm going towards. I'm going towards feedback. Yeah. So the supernovae, like the supernova can go off and it can enrich the, the nearby gas. But of course, you need to have a, you need to have, you know, high density gas at some region simultaneously to able to turn on star formation and things like that. Uh, but again, here, the situation is that you have cold gas detected by why, how come you can't form stars in the elliptical gas? So, uh, are you going to talk about a little bit about the physical? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, not about star formation because we are not talking. So, uh, I understand. Mm -hmm. So, when the largest found out already, you need some water vision. Right? Yeah. So let's say I have a, I have, I mean, well, in principle, an infinite gas of, of, of same density is also up to you. Uh -huh. uh, but in principle, you also do need some triggering here to start forming. Pumping away, pumping much. Yeah. Right? yeah. I mean, Supernova exposure is one of the ways of doing it because you sort of drive a shock wave. Yeah. Then you have some regions where there is uh, enhanced density which might trigger star formation. Mm -hmm. right? Magnetic field uh, are another physical right. process which right. is debated whether it aids star formation or it stops it. Mm -hmm. so it's not very clear. Mm -hmm. But uh, because they hold on to plasma and the frozen in, so it does play the role in plumping of magnetic field. Kind of tries to oppose it, right? Yeah. Um, but there's some fundamental difference there between the magnetic distribution in, in this, this kind of galaxies and normal star forming galaxies, or I mean, and Rajesh just pointed out, I mean, are there not enough supernova figures, supernova for things like that? I mean, I mean, so, in this context, so we are not really bothered about the exact the conditions that you need for triggering star formation. Uh, so we generally think that when you have the cold gas kind of looking at a similar distribution, similar density, let's say spatially, uh, between a spiral and an elliptical, and you detect the same kind of gas, you would have star formation. Whatever that process is, that would not be different, right? So the conditions, that's what we assume. So here the question is, you seem to have those gas, but where is this, why is this gas not forming stars? So I'm not going to the detail of the star formation. I'm kind of going into the question of why you have the fuel, but you cannot have the stars forming. So yeah, those are are all very like plausible conditions for forming. Yeah. So when I'm talking about cold, I'm talking about similar density gas. Yeah. 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 Right. Right. And that depends on density. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that could also be an influencer in this story, right? Yeah, so that could be an influencer, but we, again, as I said, we have, like, there have been, there is a survey called Atlas 3D, which just looked at elliptical galaxies and detected cold gas, similar to the, maybe not as much as spiral galaxies have, as I said, but they still have enough cold gas to, like, see the star formation that, and, like, you don't see that expected star formation. That's the problem. So you need something else, and that something else is some kind of energy that you distribute, and you like you don't you kind of either break it up, you don't let the gas to clump together, or you just blow it up, or you heat it up. So something like that is needed. So that's where I'm going towards. So you have cold gas, but you are not forming stars. So something must be happening. And uh, of course, as uh, you pointed out, there have been actually many theories why you if you have a reservoir of gas. What can happen to it so that it's not forming stars? And there have been many models, and in most cases, it breaks down when it tries to explain a massive elliptical galaxy because you have to have really something really energetic or something really, you know, drastic to explain that. And I will talk about the most famous theory or the theory that is most successful, and that is the feedback theory. So the feedback is that some sort of energy is distributed in this cold gas, and as I said, 
it's either heating up the gas, so the cold gas no longer re remains cold gas, it becomes hot gas, and it becomes unsuitable for forming stars, or it just, it removes the gas from the central region. So, you know, the central region where all the majority of the star formation happens, there is no longer gas there, you just blow it up, and it kind of, it reduces the density or thin it up, things like that. So why, who will supply that feedback energy? Uh, so again, there have been many candidates and actually supernovae is one of the candidates. So supernovae can also produce this sort of feedback hitting. Uh, but again, it has not been very successful in explaining the, the massive elliptical galaxy. So the most celebrated theory and the most famous theory is that the feedback from active galactic nuclei or AGN. So we all know that all galaxies have a central supermassive black hole and they accrete mass from the, uh, from the surrounding uh, like that. And sometimes they can turn on and they can drive energy and radiation from the center. And, uh, and they can be luminous over a large part of the electromagnetic spectrum. So that's when it's called the active galactic nuclei or AGN. And these AGNs or these black holes actually have quite a lot of energy. So the energy they have is 10 to the 61 or, yeah. Yes, yes. Yep, yeah. That 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 is the that is what you need, right? You need a theory where you have the energy. You have a lot of energy in the black hole, but it's it's near the center, and you have to distribute the heat somehow somehow to the whole galaxy. So that was a problem for a long time, and so around 2006-2007. So the question is now: How is this? energy feedback energy how is this feedback process happening so you have as he said like you have the energy near the center coming from the black hole how is this energy transferred to the whole galaxy so around 2006-2007 a new theory was uh, implemented in the simulations of the galaxy formation models they call it the, the radio or the jet mode AGM feedback and uh, the the goal is the same you basically heat up the gas, right? The heat up the entire reservoir of the gas. And how do you do that? So this is kind of the basic mechanism that was uh, that was implemented in the model. So you have, so this is this is called this jet mode uh, feedback. So this is generally implemented in old galaxies, so which is kind of massive. And you have some gas which is radiatively cooling, or it's already cold, right? So you have some gas there. So a, some of that gas makes its way into the black hole, and the black hole accretes in an inefficient way. So the, there's not a lot of gas to begin with, right? But there are still sufficient, right? So that's what I was saying. And this, some of this gas makes its way into the black hole, and this black hole drives this radio jet. And this jet eventually deposits mechanical energy to the gas. Why, why, why do actually yeah. Right? It's generally, it's generally, yeah, because you generally uh, see this jet in radio because it's driven by the non-thermal synchrotron emission. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and you generally detect them in radio. Like it's it's called loosely called radio, but it's no. So these. So the, uh, so those are different kinds. So the jet is you can never see in radio. Uh, is, you can never see in X-ray. So sometimes you can see the black hole or the AGN to be visible in X-ray only when the matter is accreted in a really efficient way. So it's called Eddington uh, in an Eddington limit or more. So you have a lot of matter here. It's inefficient. So it's accreting in an inefficient way. And the second, when you are uh, saying about the X-rays generating form when jets are heating the matter, so that's different. When you have shock hit, so when you are shock hitting the gas, so there have been X-rays detected, but not from those jets. Yeah. It depends. Uh, yes. I mean, so, so then it's actually very confined along the track. Yeah. So you would expect whatever heating is happening to be also confined on that. But yeah. But here your problem of global distribution there. Yeah. How does that happen? Yeah. So there have been again many like theories that uh, and that have been like implemented in simulations as well. So what you do is uh, the jet deposits energy to the surroundings and that that the gas there 
it transfers the heat by shock heating and then there is also when you are driving the jet you are actually creating a cocoon and you are driving the gas in all directions and you kind of see this kind of shock like shock heated gas being driven outwards in all directions so, so what is the typical I mean, thermal is a bit slower because you you have a lot of different kind of mechanisms here to use the heat. But what is the average mixing time? Let's just call it a mixing time. What is the typical mixing time scale of the energy that is being you know generated by the jet across the whole global zone? Uh, by mixing time scale, do you mean the time in which time the roughly the the let's call it the thermal energy uh, gets okay. distributed across the whole cold gas that you have globally. Okay, so this is okay. So this is generally like yeah, mechanical energy that you are depositing there. It could be thermal. It could be. I don't care about them. But okay. What is the, the the net like the average mixing time scale of this? Yeah. So the jets actually they do not stay for a long time. The jets turn on and off. So these are episodic, and sometimes jets are seen to kind of change their angle as well. So that also comes to the picture, and then the jet turning on and off time scale is like several like. uh like 0.1 giga year or like roughly so if you talk about a roughly an average time scale that would be of the same order uh so that's like that's a jet time scale right uh -huh. and i'm more interested in what is the time scale for distributing the energy across the whole perigal domain so yeah since you see in this dynamic system like physics is really i think distilled into the time scale uh huh you can figure that out that Gives you an understanding of how this mechanism works. Uh huh. You know, over the years, the time, you know, the time scale of the system is very interesting. Right, right. But when you have like observations, you have to what you have to reconcile is that you have an observation, let's say with a jet, and then you have an observation, let's say with some winds, right? right. So you have to kind of piece together a puzzle from different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So simulations have you have like time scale estimates, but here we are kind of trying to piece. Density, density around the black hole. Gas density on the black hole. Yeah, it, it depends on the amount of mass that the black hole has to accrete. So that is something the Newton ratio. Uh huh. Uh huh. But it requires enough gas to be around so that you know the conduction or the heat. Yeah. Yeah, but in this, like, generally you have you see gas, so that's the thing. You see gas in this galaxy. You see gas, but you don't see the star formation. So that's why you have gas. So in order to drive this outward shocks and outward cooling shocks. Well, like from observations, we can't tell. Uh, from theory, there has been some models which have played around with the spin and the, you know, the black hole orientation. Um, you know, it might work. It might play a role in kind of triggering the jets. Like, how will these jets kind of evolve once you have some mass falling in? But once you have the jet, it doesn't really it doesn't depend. depend. Yeah, it doesn't really depend. Again, from the observational perspective. The energy propagation uh -huh. across the disk and the jet is just generally doesn't matter. No, it's no. Very close to the yeah. Right. Right. Exactly. 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 Uh, but yeah, like as you can see, like just implementing this model was actually very, it was very successful because when you go and try to compare with observations, some consistency with some scaling relations or things you see in galaxies, they found to be very, it, to be very successful. So implementing this model worked out energetically and also worked out in a in a sense of just comparing with observations. So this was. This was from 2006, but actually, this type of uh, theory was actually motivated by real observations uh, from galaxy clusters. So the X-ray you are talking about becomes relevant here in a cluster because clusters have lots of gas in a shock-heated virial temperature of million Kelvin. In individual galaxies, you don't have gas at that high temperature. So anyway, so this is uh, this is actually this is not a simulation. This is a real observation of a galaxy cluster. So clusters are a bunch of galaxies which are gravitationally bound, which are really huge. So if you look at the spatial scale, this is like 200 kiloparsecs. So this is like almost a like a megaparsec. So this is really big. 
Uh, this picture uh, is actually a composite image of three different images taken at three different wavelengths. So the background galaxies are uh, optical image taken from Hubble. The blue here, the blue indicates the really hot gas, which is seen in X-rays, taken by Chandra. And then the jet, it's uh, synchrotron emission visible in radio wavelength. So these are detected in VLA. And you can see the luminous blob at the center. So these depict the presence of a central AGN, which is kind of driving this jet. And if you look closely, you can see the, the region where the jet is the jet is interacting with this gas is creating this kind of cavities here. So yeah. So the, this is a cluster and this is a BCG, like the central, like the most luminous galaxy. And this is 200 kiloparsecs. So this is really huge. Like this is like 800 kiloparsecs. The, the galaxy would be at the center somewhere here. So this would be like, yeah. It just, yeah, so it's, it has been seen. Like the clusters have really high temperature, million Kelvin gas, and has been detected in X-ray, like diffuse X-ray emission along the, um, yeah. No, you don't see that, right? So you don't have the gas at a, at a much higher, like, video temperature. Uh, so that you don't see. But here, since you see in X-ray the gas, you can see the jets to hit the gas and create this kind of cavities or pockets. Um, uh, like here, like the ones that I have pointed out. And people have calculated the energy that is in both cavities, and people saw that this is of the same order, like 10 to the 60 hours or so, which is what you expect to come from a black hole. And uh, that is actually enough to counterbalance the cooling of this hot gas. So the reason the hot gas cannot cool down and form a lot of stars is because there is this energy that is injected by the jet. So this is a direct example of this jet mode feedback that I was talking about. And there have been actually many more examples as well. But these are all in clusters. And as uh, you pointed out, can we see that in field galaxies? Can we see that in individual galaxies, right? So that's the question. So can this same phenomena work at a, uh, let, let me hide that. Can I hide that? OK. Let me forget it. But what I wrote here is that can the same phenomena happen at a much smaller scale of individual galaxy, not a cluster BCG, but in individual galaxy, which are barely like tens of kiloparsec, let's say. So unfortunately, there has been no observational evidences of this sort of feedback in individual uh, elliptical galaxies or in individual uh, uh, field galaxies. Uh, can we hide that? Yeah. It's fine, I think. Okay. Oh, okay, okay, hide. Uh, the keynote? Oh, this one. Yeah, so unfortunately, there is no observational evidence, as you were asking, in individual galaxies of those radio kind of jet mode feedback. But we still think that once we have an old evolved galaxy, it, it can have some cold gas floating around. But the reason those cold gas cannot form stars is because something like this is happening. Maybe in, in this, not in this large scale, maybe in a much smaller scale of individual galaxies. So the individual galaxies are like tens of kiloparsecs, right? So as you can see, this would be much harder to detect because these would be much smaller in scale and this would be coming from much lower luminosity AGN. Yeah. 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 So there are, uh, I actually kind of simplified the introduction. So within the AGN feedback, there are also like different modes. So one is the radiative mode when you have radiation uh, pressure uh, doing the work. There are also like mechanical mode or the jet mode that I'm talking about. But in the spiral galaxies, what you see is you have a lot of gas, right? You have a lot of gas and that's much more than what you see here. And the black hole is still kind of young. It's evolving. So it does, we do see uh, like Seaford, Seaford galaxies with like AGNs, like small scale jets. And there have been evidence of those small scale jets pushing some gas, but that doesn't make a visible impression in the whole, in the whole galaxy. 
because the black hole is still evolving, the black hole is still kind of small, right? So in spiral galaxies, they are still kind of evolving. Um, and yeah, that's also a different mode. But I'm not talking about that. So I'm talking about elliptical galaxies. Yeah. 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 So do you mean like if AGMs trigger star formation or not? Yeah. So there has also been evidence for that. These are like positive feedback. Like those are the ones where you have like you know. Uh huh. Uh, yeah, so that that is also seen, like that is seen, but those are again a different population. Those are spirals or young galaxies. I'm talking about old galaxy where you have a much evolved black hole. The black hole mass is more. Yeah, it could also yeah. So of course you see much many more old galaxies close to us, but there have also been evolved elliptical galaxies further out. For example, JWST I think detected. An elliptical galaxy like Redshift of five or things like that, but it has been detected. Uh, but anyway, so my question is: Is uh, this feedback is it responsible for keeping galaxies quenched or keeping galaxies at a low star formation level? We don't know that yet. Of of course, we have to find actual observational evidences in this typical each galaxy, right? So you cannot just take a cluster and say, well, feedback works. You have to show that in galaxy scale as well. So that's what we are trying to kind of find observationally. And how do we go about finding them? You generally have to study both the black hole and the host galaxy. And as you can see, figure out the jets that talk to the gas surrounding the, uh, in the, on, the, on the host galaxy. So you have to study both the black hole and the gas. So in order to uh, detect and to characterize the AGN and the jets, you need radio, you need optical observations, but you also have to study the multi-phase gas. So you have different temperature gas, you have different density of gas. So there is warm ionized medium, which is at a temperature of let's say 10,000 Kelvin. You have cooler medium, there you have cold molecular gas. You have hot gas, which are detected in X-ray. Uh, and for each of these different kinds of gas, you need different observational tracers to look, to trace, to, to see this gas and what is this gas doing. But the main point of this busy slide is that you don't have to read everything that is in there. But the main point is that in order to, to look for feedback, first you have to study the, the black hole, the AGN properties, and you also have to study the galaxy gas properties. And you need multi-wavelength observation. So you need radio, you need optical, you need infrared, you also sometimes need X-ray. Uh, uh, to look at really hot gas, if there is generally it's none, uh, it's very hard to detect X-ray from individual galaxies, but also sometimes UV. And uh, you kind of need to look at them in a spatially resolved way. So you can see where, what is happening in different parts of a galaxy. So what is our goal? To kind of just take a step back. Our goal is to find this sort of AGN feedback signatures in typical galaxies, not in clusters, in typical 10 kiloparsec galaxies in old elliptical galaxies. And for that, we need radio, but we also need spatially resolved optical infrared observations to kind of look at that, right? Okay, so that's, uh, so that's what I have been doing. So uh, that brings me to the Manga survey. So Manga is a part of the Sloan Digital Sky Survey 4. So if you have ever worked on galaxies or you have heard about galaxy people talking, you will hear Sloan a lot. So SDSS is a really big survey and Manga is a part of that survey. So Manga is an IFU survey. So what IFU means is that it's an integral field unit uh, spectroscopy. So it gives you spatially resolved spectra for each galaxy. And Manga has observed about 10,000 galaxies. And the wavelength range that is covered is mostly optical, but also parts of near infrared. But let me show you what Manga can do. So this is a normal, this is an elliptical galaxy as seen by Sloan Digital Sky Survey image. Pretty, it's a normal looking galaxy. But then you can put the manga fibers on top of this galaxy. And now if you observe, you can get a spectra from different parts of the same galaxy. So you can see the spectra from that region is this one. The spectra from this region is that one. And then it kind of varies, right? So just looking, the same galaxy is showing different properties at different locations. 
And you can see the spectra to be like varying, right? So Manga gives you a lot of information to play around with. And let's say you are interested in something like the ionized gas. What is the ionized gas doing in this galaxy? You look at, let's say, H alpha, an optical line that you generally use to trace uh, uh, ionized gas. So you look at those lines in the spectra and you measure whatever property you're interested in. Let's say you are measuring flux or velocity or kinematics. And whatever you do, you do that for all those different locations and you get a map like that. So instead of getting one value from the whole galaxy, you are getting a 2D information, a 2D map of that property. Okay, so. Is that a ground based This is an SDSS image, yeah. So these are all ground based. So part of SDSS, so Sloan Digital Sky Survey. Okay, so again, so as you can see, the manga gave us a lot of information, right? So we have 10,000 galaxies, and each of those galaxies have all these different spectra coming from different locations. So we have a lot of data to work with. Um, so manga has led to the discovery of many different things, and Red Geysers is actually one of those, it's a product of the manga survey. So just to kind of uh, introduce what Red Geysers are, so this is a very normal looking uh, elliptical galaxy. Uh, it has very low star formation. It has a moderate mass, exactly what you'd expect, like around 10 to the 10.7. Um, and if you look at the integrated spectra, not spatially resolved, but integrated spectra, so spectra coming from the entire region, you would see the spectra to be dominated by old stars. So that's exactly what you expect. So elliptical galaxies have old stars, you'd expect that, so that's what you see. So there is nothing special going on about this galaxy. If you just look at the SDSS uh, integrated observations. So are they born as other normal spiral galaxies eventually evolved to them? Yeah, that's the normal. Uh, so why is the mission The explosion? No, so. Yeah, so the normal, uh, so the, again, the, the accepted theory is that you go through some merger phase and you kind of, you have, you accrete gas. And then eventually that gas kind of swirl in and they kind of disrupt the disky rotation. And that kind of makes the gas to be puffier and then it become more spherical. So that's the accepted belief. But we kind of, it's hard to say just from observations, right? So How? The bar? Oh, oh when I. Galaxy, uh, oh, yeah. Oh, so the, the stellar mass. Like the uh, mass of the star. Okay, stars are old, so basically they have lost uh, wings or whatever. Yeah, yeah, there are some ejections that are happening. And so, so, yeah. So, the visible mass in stars? Yeah, the total mass contained in all the mass. Uh, uh, so, the mass, mass luminosity, the mass luminosity, and you can, yeah, you can just measure the, the photometry. You can measure the light coming from the stars, and you can take a M by L ratio, and then you can calculate the mass. You can also do like spectral, like SCD fitting, and you can take like different. You can take measurements in different bands, and then you can fit the stellar models and see what the combined stellar population would be, and how does that compare with the galaxy. So that's how you measure. Uh, okay, but uh, so so again, this is a very normal looking elliptical galaxy, but the authors of this paper, they actually looked at this galaxy with Manga data. And this is what they saw. So here, this is a Manga map, as you can see, so this is, a spatially resolved uh, uh, distribution of the warm ionized gas as traced by the H alpha emission line. So this is just showing how the warm ionized gas is distributed in across the face of that galaxy, right? So is that is that okay with everyone? Because I know this is not something that you see on a daily basis. It's kind of it's hard to wrap your mind around. Um, but yeah, so this is exactly how the ionized gas is distributed. And you kind of see this bisymmetric or biconical structure, right, across the whole galaxy. And, huh. oh, no, so the spatial resolution is like 2.5 arc seconds. So you cannot go to parsec part 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 level. Yeah, you cannot go down to parsec level. Uh, but yeah, the central will be somewhere in the center. And just by looking at the map, it looks like as if the gas is being kind of you know, material is being driven out from the center. And that is exactly what the authors looked at. They look at the motion 
of the gas, the velocity, the kinematics, and they model that, and they did indeed find that this galaxy particularly have ionized gas outflow along this wind, along this structure that you are seeing. So this galaxy was actually coined the name Red Geyser, red because this galaxy is red and dead. There is no star formation, very little star formation. And geyser because they, they kind of show this geyser or a fountain-like structure in their ionized gas lab. So this was the first kind of prototypical red geyser that was that came out in this paper. So that's actually one of the main, like one of the uh, the things that has been discussed. It's called frustrated jets. So you have radio jets, and I'll talk about that. So you have radio jets. And sometimes they do not grow. You don't see a lot of large scale jets in, in the red geysers. You see small scale structures. And uh, you do have a lot of gas lying around here, right? So one of the theories is that, yes, they might have a, like a dense region. And that is not letting the jet uh, to grow. But it can also be that the jet would eventually grow. And the gas would eventually thin out. And you can. And we do see some large scale jets in the red geysers as well. But uh, what? Uh, the, but then I joined the project, and I actually found that there are many, many examples like these red geysers in the Manga dataset. So right now we have about like 150 galaxies that show this kind of red geyser structures. So now you can no longer ta talk about it as one galaxy, right, or one outlier galaxy. You have to talk about them as a population or as a as a bunch of galaxies that is showing this kind of properties, and we have to understand what is happening in these galaxies. So of course, the, the, the big question that we have at the back of our mind is, is this showing any kind of feedback? Because you see this kind of wind structures, and you don't see a lot of star formation happening. So whether there is showing any kind of feedback, but we, of course, we don't know that yet. So we are trying to kind of address that question from different angles. OK, so just let me know whenever I'm kind of close to the time, because I might not, uh, I think with all the technical Okay, so I will talk about the one of the things that we address is whether these galaxies have any GN to begin with, which could drive this sort of feedback. Because in order to drive feedback, you need to have AGN, right? You need to have radio AGNs. You need to have those kind of right kind of uh, AGNs to begin with. So for that, we actually looked at the radio data because. Uh, radio is where we kind of see this kind of AGNs to be the most. We looked at first survey because first is the sky, the sky coverage of first overlaps with the manga survey, so you go you get a complete data set. So we already have the red geyser sample, right? So our goal, what is our goal? Our goal is to see whether red geysers have more radio emission or less than the central region, and whether that is. Uh, more or less than similar group of other control galaxies. So control would be other elliptical galaxies which are not red geysers. So whether red geysers show anything special in their radio emission. So that is our goal. And to kind of select that control group of galaxies, we have to do some matching. Uh, I'm kind of leaving out the technical details, but we got a control group of galaxies. And then what we did is we just cross-matched our red geyser sample and our control ga uh, galaxies with the first survey. So we wanted to see how many of the red geysers are radio detected versus how many of control galaxies are radio detected. So control galaxies are also elliptical galaxies. So those have similar mass, similar redshift, similar kind of morphology, but those are not red geysers. So they do not show this kind of bisymmetric structure. They, they do not see other show other red geyser properties that we have. So you are kind of uh, comparing, so that you are comparing apples to apples. So you're not comparing, you know, spirals with ellipticals or things like that. Uh -huh. So yeah, so these are actually equivalent width. So this is, equivalent width is, a, is something very similar to flux. So it's a... Uh, oh. Oh, here, here? Oh, this one? Yeah. Oh, so these are like four. This is four, this is five, this is three. That one is around, that's three, right? Yeah. Yeah. 
yeah yeah so equivalent with is the flux when then you divide by the stellar part so you only get the emission for the h alpha so you only get the gas uh, contribution but anyway i think i was talking okay so i was talking about the radio uh, right the radio detection and i found that about red geysers always show a three times higher detection rate than the control so whatever control galaxy i'm choosing the radio detection rate is always three times lower than the red geyser sample so red geysers always show more radio detection in the first survey but of course that's not enough there are maybe many signals which are lying below the detection threshold of this first survey so the first has a sensitivity of say 1 milli gen c so which is which is not great so it's definitely missing out many of the low luminosity signatures so to get around that what we did is we are stacking radio images so what we are trying to do here is in order to pick out some of the low signals we are co-adding the radio images of all these red geysers and we are doing the same for control galaxies and we are comparing their flux so here the y axis is the stacked radio flux so here again what you are i'm just repeating so we are taking the radio images of all the radio of the red geysers stack that and measure the flux and we do the same for the control galaxy then see what the total radio flux coming from them is it normalized by mass or something or is it uh, compared to different things no so the when we were so selecting we the mass, uh, so i'm just putting the galaxy the co adding the images putting the images on top of each other and measure their combined photonics so, so there is they have roughly equal mass because when i selected the control galaxy yeah no so the control galaxies were selected by following the same mass distribution so that's why we said control um yeah so uh yeah we stacked and we found that the red points which is the stacked radio flux for the red geysers so the y axis is logarithmic so the red point is about 4 to 5 times higher than the blue point but then uh, what if you have a few sources in the red geyser sample which just have happened to have really high radio for example you have 10 numbers you are calculating their mean if three of them is really high your mean will be really high right so you might have some bias there so in the next step what we did is we kind of removed everything that has a high radio signal and we just stacked them again so they, those are the ones that we call radio non detection so the ones which are not that radio bright which are not individual detected but we stack them anyway and again we found the signal and we found the red geysers to have a higher radio flux so the point of this paper was this so the red geysers always show enhanced radio flux and we confirmed that uh, these are coming from the low luminosity agent in the center i'm not going into that detail because this will again take up a lot of time but uh, the this paper actually talked about that like this agn this uh, radio emission is coming from the central agn and these red geysers they seem to preferentially host more low luminosity agns than similar passive galaxies and then if you want to look at how exactly this radio uh, emissions look like so this is what the radio emissions look like so these are kind of looking at the morphology of all these radio emissions so here we used a much sensitive and low frequency radio observation called lofar so lofar is from an european consortium where they are uh, they have really sensitive radio observations much more sensitive than first and we and you can see that we see all kinds of radio structures you can see those compact you can see those kind of extended structures and so something is definitely happening here but we are kind of losing that due to spatial resolution so here the resolution is like 6 arc second so you are definitely blending and you are here you are seeing those large scale jets that i was talking about the radio jets here also you see those jets um and here you also see those some one kind one sided thing so you see all kinds of structures here uh but after looking at all the all the radio observations we actually could see that the red geysers they seem to be showing more compact so more kind of central nuclear radio sources than those extended jets and that's why i was saying that uh, maybe some of these have those kind of small scale jets that 
cannot grow to those large scale, maybe because of the density of the gas holding them in. Uh, I don't have a lot of time, so let me actually uh, skip a lot of this technical details. Uh, I have five minutes, right? Yeah. So let me actually talk about uh, another observation that I did. Yeah. Yeah. The technical. Okay. So another observation that we did is we basically looked at how do we know that these red geysers actually host wind? So I have been telling you that this, this red geyser show this kind of ionized wind, but that this observation was kind of focused on how do we know that? So for that, we actually did some modeling and we combined some high resolution observations. So let me skip over many of the things. Um, and uh, let me just tell you that we actually constructed some models. So here, we have a toy wind model where you have gas moving in a radially outward direction. And then we also have gas moving in a rotating disk. Are purely hydrodynamic? No, so these are no, so these are actually toy models where you only you take a Cartesian grid of points, you put a galaxy with some known density as you have in observations, and you put you have a field phone where you put gas particles by hand and you throw them in a radially outward direction. And you just want to see how the, like the cone, the cone geometry and the rotating geometry, how that affects in your total observed spectra of the galaxy. Right. Kind of get some emission from exactly. Some exactly. Form. Exactly. So that's exactly what we did. We tried to. So the MHK simulations, we tried. So we actually tried actually isolated galaxy simulations where we took the fire. Are you aware of the fire simulations? So those are large volume zoom in simulations taken from large cosmological simulation and then they zoom in towards the center with really high resolution. So we took that output and then we put an AGN jet and then we ionized the material by running cloudy and things like that and we included magnetic fields and we have some uh, observations from there. But this is nothing like that. Um, and also, <laughs> uh, it's very hard to kind of like talk about all this in this short time. So I have, I'm not talking about that at all. Uh, but here, the goal is exactly what uh, you said, is to kind of forward model the emission lines, like to see what, to kind of have something to compare with our observations to our spectra that we are seeing. And one of the things, one of the fun things that I actually saw is that from winds, you actually always see asymmetric emission lines because we, this is a cone and it's at an angle at an angle with you right and this cone when you kind of integrate along the line of sight and you dissect the cone along the along the volume you have different volumes of gas that you are integrating over and you kind of see this emission lines to change and that's exactly what we saw in our observations so uh, let me just show you what we actually find using Keck observation. So Keck is a 10 meter telescope, which is really great. And that's a telescope that we have access to from UCSC. And there we actually saw that the emission lines are asymmetric exactly as we predicted from our models. So that kind of helped us solidify the wind theory. Let me uh, take you to my full summary slide that I have prepared for my thesis talk. <laughs> but uh, so so this is kind of what we think is happening in red geysers so if someone asks you what is a red geyser so red geysers in general these are elliptical galaxies they are old galaxies they have old stars so that's why you have this kind of orange stars uh, you have a black hole there uh, you have a low luminosity AGN so sometimes they have large scale radio jets, but more often than not, they have smaller scale uh, radio signatures very close to the center. And we see gas being driven out in H alpha. Some of them make its way out of the galaxy, completely escaping. Some of that might not escape all the way. So they kind of lying around. So from observations, we see the gas to be like, independent of how, like the extent of the jet. So we looked at the radio extent of this jet 
and we see how much that correlates with the gas that's being driven out. And we see that more or less all these red geysers have gas outflows and they more or less have AGN, but the exact morphology of the jet doesn't depend, doesn't, doesn't affect the velocity that we are seeing. So essentially you're saying that you can get a mass flux from uh -huh. the jet mm -hmm. observations, and you can also get a mass flux from the outflows, they don't match. Mm. So the two completely independent mechanisms, jet is not driving the outflow. The jet is kind of evolving. So in some cases, we, did, we see small scale jets. In some cases, we see large scale jets. And the, the galaxies which are having this large scale jets, they seem to be more evolved than the ones which are small scale jets. So they actually, it might be true that those smaller scale eventually break out and give those large scale. And the jet time scales are not that high. So they can turn on and off. But those gas outflows are there all the time. And that's what we find, at least for these galaxies. But there is also selection effect. So we are selecting the galaxies based on this bisymmetric structures, right? So we are selecting kind of in a biased way. So in some ways, if we could take all the radio jetted galaxies and see whether they show outflows, not all of them show outflows. So here, the selection is kind of driving uh, this. But in the red geysers that we're looking at, so we have radio agents and we have jets and we have outflows driving as well. And there is another thing that we see that I did not talk about, is we actually also see some cool neutral gas which is inflowing to the galaxy. And in some cases, we see some tidal tails from companion galaxies kind of feeding gas uh, and kind of connecting the center. And we think it might play a role in the triggering of the AGN, but uh, we are not sure at this point. So we do see a lot of gas lying around in this galaxy, so that's the point. But we don't see that level of star formation that we expect. Uh, yeah, so I think this was kind of the summary slide, but I couldn't get through all of the results because of this really like delay in the technical things. But I think the main, the fascinating thing about these galaxies was that you see all this gas and you expect a lot of star formation. You don't see that star formation, but you see this kind of radio jets and you see this outflow. So they have to do something with the, the feedback. But of course, it's, it, it will be very ambitious to say, okay, these are showing feedback, but uh, these are kind of uh, mechanisms at play. And the final kind of slide that I wanted to show is, uh, I can show maybe. So, so yeah, so as a postdoc, I will be working with uh, some of the James Webb data and uh, so, so one of the things that I will be working on is uh, looking at radio galaxies at really high redshift. So one of the power of this James Webb is that it can see fainter targets at much high redshift. We have spectra from galaxies at redshift of 8, 8.5. So that is just amazing. And we couldn't think about that before. Um, and huh? I just <laughs> um, but yeah, so one of the things that I'll be doing is looking at radio galaxies at redshift of six, which is the farthest known radio galaxies that we know, that, that at least we know of. And I'll be looking at the host galaxy of that, and then I can compare with what we are seeing in the nearby universe. For example, in red geysers, in non-red geyser radio galaxies, or in control galaxies. So we can compare what we know from in the nearby universe to what we do not know about uh, the furthest known galaxies. So yeah, uh, I think uh, kind of trying to very rapidly summarizing everything, I think uh, the red geysers are interesting and that's what I have been mostly uh, worked on in my PhD. And I think with JWST, we would be seeing many, many, many more things in the, in the nearby next two decades. But yeah, I think I'll stop. I, I feel like uh, I, I could take some questions if you have them. Okay, thank you. I should have made it more. We interested you a lot. <laughs> no. No, no, that's good. Yeah, so I don't know if you can hear me, uh, but if you have questions uh, from the audience, you can go ahead and ask. Let me just add that um, um, normal of the data are masters and BHC and masters in physics from presidency, and then a PhD from the University of uh, California at Santa Cruz. And now she is on her way to uh, Johns Hopkins University, where she will be working with uh, uh, Team Heckman. Yeah, and Team, also with the uh, Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore um, for her postdoc, where she'll be using JWST data with other 
other observations. Yeah, like so, Hubble also, Hubble and yeah. general so Going, uh, Moving from ground-based to space-based now. So do you have any questions <laughs> from the people online? Also, this was a very Okay, can I ask some great questions? Just go ahead for now. Yeah. Okay, I, I think... I was just trying to understand. So, how we conclude there are no new stars that are forming? I mean, I, I do not. I'm not an astrophysicist. So uh -huh. Oh, so okay. So you measure the star formation rate, so which is basically how many stars are forming right now. So for measuring the star formation rate, you basically uh, first of all look at the spectra, and you see if there are any signatures of. Uh, so there are stellar population models that you compare to, and you look for the presence of certain emission lines that only that originates from young stars. Uh, emission and absorption lines uh, that we expect. And then you also do something called spectral like ACD fitting, where you take the, uh, I, I think I was talking about it at some point. So you take the photometry or you measure the photometry from different bands, from different wavelength bands, and you uh, construct the ACD and then you, con like you uh, compare with models. And then you can derive the star formation rate. Like, like the ACD will have different shapes depending on how much young stars you have. So from there, you can predict how many stars it's forming. So that gives you the star formation rate, yeah. So basically you're saying that in these kind of galaxies, the optical rate guys are uh -huh. not having such a data. Yeah, so yeah it, does, yeah, it doesn't show young stars. So it mostly have old stars, so stars which are old. And you see the so the spectra. No, so is there an yeah. expectation? Because I mean, I, somehow I, maybe I got confused. You say that these are old galaxies, so you yes. expect the stars to be old as well, right? Why right, do you right, right. New stars? Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so these are old galaxies, but the thing is that they. Do I mean, so how do you define the age of the galaxy than the star? Right? I thought the stars should be. If when you say galaxy is old, the stars are old, right? That's what you mean. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry. So the stars. Are, when I when I'm talking about old galaxies, I mean the stars. The stars composing the galaxies are old. So yeah. isn't it by definition it exclude the possibility of new stars or not? Oh, so the question that I was looking for is these red geysers. These have old stars, but they have a lot of gas lying around. So these should trigger some new stars, formation of new stars. But we don't see those new stars. We only see old stars. So we don't see a lot of star formation happening. So that was uh, my uh, kind of pep talk in the beginning. So basically, I think what we're trying to say is that uh, that even old galaxy stars, which are old, which comprise the galaxy, mm -hmm. has enough gas still to in principle form stars, but it doesn't yeah. have. Yeah. So the central problem is to sort of figure out why do old stars switch off. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So old stars is there. So if you have a lot of gas, you can trigger new stars, right? So that is not forming. So even though you have so a lot is of that gas, understood? I mean, is that well understood? Like, you know, like, what is the criteria for star formation? Yeah, so if you have a temperature, let's say, below a certain temperature, and then you have the conditions for forming stars, it should it should form stars. Like there's there is nothing special about elliptical galaxies not being able to form stars because they don't have something. Like they should form stars. So that's the expectation, right? Uh, like you have the density, you have the temperature, you have the gas that you need. It's just that you cannot, for some reason, you cannot form stars, and that that was that was the reason that I was talking about. So you need some sort of energy to either you know, dissipate the gas or make it thinner, make it less dense to hit the gas or do something to it. Like if you just keep it as it is, it will cool down really fast and it will form stars. But it doesn't happen in old, in elliptical galaxies. Okay. Is that? No, it's okay. I mean, uh, yeah. Maybe I don't understand that. Stuff. So yeah, because I was a bit confused with the statement. Huh. The old, I mean, by definition, old galaxies is galaxy which has old stars. Yeah, but it doesn't matter if it's old or new. If you have gas, uh, cold gas, you should form stars. So if you see gas and you don't see a lot of star formation. And so I'm just wondering, is yeah. that a well understood phenomenon that if you have enough? Huh? Is, is that a well established thing? Like if you have a gas, you make much so. Yeah. So if you, well, have, you don't even need like a, a gene's length scale and all those things. Like, yeah, like yeah. So you have gas, it doesn't mean that you form a star, right? Right, right. So if you have like a certain temperature and density of the gas, 
Uh, and if you see the spatial distribution, and if you see ga like, let's say we generally use like CO, like molecular gas, like right to trace cold dense gas. So if you see a lot of CO in the galaxy, you would see star formation. So in some galaxies you do see that, but in general in elliptical galaxies you don't see that uh, that level of star formation. So that's that's the problem to begin with. So it, something spooky might happen just in elliptical galaxies, which. Especially you are saying that between old galaxies and new galaxies, there is no fundamental change in the nature of the diffuse gas. There is no fundamental change in the nature of the diffuse gas. Uh, yeah, yeah. I think yeah. that's the central. Thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it doesn't matter whether it's old or new, right? So it, there is no change in the condition of the gas. Once you have that gap, you should form star formation. So that is the central uh, key point here. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, any more questions uh, from the online audience? Uh, is there any questions in YouTube? I think I saw a few people in YouTube. I don't know if there's any questions or not. Um, in the meantime, is there any questions here? No questions from me. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, and everybody. And sorry again for the for the. I mean, we we seem to be habitually having internet issues in the admin building. <laughs> Today was no different. Particularly with new laptops, and even my old my laptop also has an issue. Mobile connectivity is fine, but there are some serious issues from laptop connectivity. So yeah, Mac was fine. And also her, her laptop was the Mac laptop. But this Mac.